quicker today because I haven't opened my Father's Day gift yet. So I'm kind of, kind of waiting to see what's in it. So nobody spoil the surprise for me. But you see the title of the message. Every day is Father's Day. And I should get an amen from all the fathers. Amen. But we're gonna we're gonna see shortly what I mean by that. As we look at one of my favorite passages of scripture in Psalm 139. But before we do there, I go there, I want to ask a question. The first question I want to ask, actually two, the first one is, is what are some of the character traits that your father has or had that you admire? Who, who would like to tell me? What are some of the character traits? Yeah. Ah, wouldn't work. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Hard worker. What's that? Hard worker. A hard worker. Okay. Loving. Loving. Spiritual leader. Spiritual leader. A provider. That was yours too. Secrecy. Integrity. Generosity. Generosity. Faithfulness to God. So when you look at these character traits of our fathers, you know, if we're blessed enough to have a Christian father, many of you mentioned things like spiritual leader and those kind of things. And as Mike said, for us as fathers, that is our God. My dad always used to say that job never ends till he reaches glory. We're always a father. But that's still not going to be the, the thrust of my message today. But I want to ask a second question as we look at this idea of every day's Father's Day. What are some of the ways that you plan to honor your father today? Or maybe if your father's home with the Lord or passed away, what are some of the ways that you have honored him on Father's Day? Speak well of him. Speak well of him.
miracle that we can just call you Father. I hope when we pray that, it's not just some religious practice that we do. But we marvel at the fact that we sinners bound to hell and now call you Father. Oh yes, you've always been our creator. And before we knew Christ, you were going to be our judge. But now that we've trusted in your Savior, trusted in your Son to save us, now we're your child. And for that we praise you. I pray, God, today you help each of us to be the children that any father would be proud of. I pray, God, you will help us to be children that not only claim that we know Christ, but we model it. And we give people an example of what it means to truly follow him. So help us today, Lord, to know a little bit about you. Help us, God, to gain in our knowledge of you. And once you gain in our knowledge of you, may it increase our faith so that we can live for you and serve you and just have joy in who we are. Thank you again for all these things. We pray you give me wisdom today as I try to preach on the amazing subject of you. Lord, I pray that I can help give each of us, including myself, just little glimpses of what your word says about you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. So Psalm 139, we'll look at verses 1 to 6 first. And it begins like this. I'm going to be using the New King James Version. That's just the version that I grew up with used all my life and I'm going to be using that this morning. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You see, first of all, we have trusted in Christ as our Savior. That's true. He knows us. Not only that, remember I quoted John, the first part of John 17, 3, that Jesus defines eternal life as the fact that we know him. When we've been brought into a right relationship with Christ, we're brought into a right relationship with God. No longer are we his enemy in our sin, but now we belong to him. We'll be looking at the book of Ephesians later and seeing that we're adopted into his family. And so David says, first of all, oh Lord, you search me and you know me. Is it comforting to know that God searches you and knows you? For, for us as believers, it is. I'm not too sure it's comfortable for unbelievers, but for us who know Christ, it's a comforting thing to know that God knows us. Then he says in verse 2, you know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought far off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Those two verses again are very comforting as the idea that God knows what we're doing, knows what we're going through. Now if we're not living for the Lord some of those things aren't so comfortable, are they? When God knows our thoughts and things that they're not guided by His word. But yet David's proclaiming this in just in awe of who God is. Verse 3 says, you comprehend my path and my lying down or acquainted with all my ways. God knows us no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, whether we're out serving him, whether we're laying sick in the hospital, whatever we're doing, God knows and knows where we are. Verse 4 says, for not a, there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. In verse 6, I hope that we leave here today with this verse on our hearts. When we think about God, that such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high, I cannot attain it. The truth of the matter is, the more we know God, we realize how little we know And how we are in awe of who he is. So I want us to look at three things in this first section. First of all, God the Father knows exactly where we are at every moment. We see that in verses 1 to 3. No way can we say that we're alone. No way can we say that that we have uh, no one with us. You know, I remember as a kid, I tried to sneak away from my earthly father. And when I did that, when I got away from his immediate vision, sometimes I did so so I, I could get in trouble. But we can't do that with God. He's, he's with us always. But on the same token, a lot of times when I sneaked away from God to get in trouble, I got in trouble. And then I wished my dad was there. And I needed him to be there. Guess what? We don't have to ever wish that our Heavenly Father is there for us because He is. Always. He's one step away. No matter whether we're walking away from Him and sin as a child, He's one step back from us just confessing that and saying, God, I need you. I need your help. No matter where we are, no matter what we're going through, our Heavenly Father never is going to let us down. Never. See, we need to meditate on these things so our faith grows so that when God asks us to do things, when he asks us to serve him, when he asks us to do difficult things, or sometimes when we're going through
through the difficult things that God's using to help us grow, we need to realize that our Father who loves us is never going to make those things for our bad. He's always doing it for our good. So then the second thing, God the Father knows our every word and every moment. Again, that should be such a comforting thought for us. It makes us think, doesn't it, too, about our words and our moments and how we're living. And then that knowledge also should, should spur us to say, listen, if God knows my every word and my every moment, maybe I ought to make sure my every word and every moment brings him glory and helps point people to Christ. So this God knows our every word and every moment. And then number three, God the Father knows how to protect his children. It says here that such, or he says, you have hedged me behind and before. The idea is it's putting a barrier around us. Behind us and before us. So where we what's behind us and coming, you remember when Pharaoh was chasing Israel's army, you know, there's a hedge there. There's, there's whatever in our past, God's put a hedge behind us to protect us. Nothing can sneak up on us that God doesn't see coming. And he also guards our path before us. We're not going to ever walk into anything that God's not there to avail us protection for. You know, when we talk about we're afraid to share the gospel, you know. We, we ought not to be afraid. Our Heavenly Father is, is there before us. Before we even get there, He's there, ready to guide us and protect us. So we can't go anywhere where God can't protect us. We can't be in any situation where God can't be there for us. I remember as a kid, I was telling somebody earlier, my dad called me a worry worm. You've heard me say that before. I used to worry about everything. When he used to wring my hands. Now I'm this morning I'm doing it because I'm cold. But... I used to do it when I worried. And my dad used to tell me, you know, when I was thinking about trying out for the football team, the American football in the States, and I'd get nervous. And he said, what do you think? Jim, God's up there going, oh, I didn't know you were going to do this today. And he, he talked with such common sense, but it was true. I praise God for a father who loved the Lord and then taught me about it because God's not surprised by anything. And that's what he kept trying to teach me. God knows. He knew it before it was going to happen, so why worry and fret? Just trust him through it. And because he's our heavenly father, he's not allowing it for our bad, he's allowing it for our good. And then when we think about those first five verses, and literally the rest of the chapter, I think Dr. Stairs could probably tell me how it hinges with the Hebrew grammar and stuff. He said he was going to come here and check me today with my, my Hebrew and Greek, so pray for me. But verse 6, he says, the response is, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high, I cannot attain it. The fact that God knows everywhere we are at every moment should give us both confidence and fear. The fact that he can comfort us and watch over us should give us confidence beyond measure. You know what it says in Philippians that uh, the peace of God that passes all understanding. See, that only can happen when we have a proper knowledge of we don't have a proper knowledge of God, we're going to worry and fear. We don't know this God that, that we can still have peace no matter what the circumstance that the world says. How can you be so confident? How can you be so relaxed going through this? You say, well, it's because of my God. He's there. You know, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, it says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. I like the fact that the writer of Proverbs said the beginning of wisdom. Because, you know, we never know everything there is to know about God. But the fear of him, this respect, I believe, uh, because as Christians, we don't need to fear his judgment. We're saved. We're going to be in his word. But this respect, this awe, this, this honor, as Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This, this idea of a proper place in our lives with God is. That's the beginning of wisdom. And as we gain knowledge of him, we get understanding Understanding about who we are in Christ. Understanding about how we walk in this world. Understanding about what God wants us to do. How he wants us to do it. Understanding his perfect plan for us. That, that no matter what, we're going to be in glory with him. See, all these things are hinged on the knowledge of the God who wrote the Bible. Many men know the Bible. The Pharisees knew the Bible. But they didn't know the God who wrote it. And today, I want us to know him as this father loves us, that we can worship and serve every day. Questions in this first section is, do we have this wisdom? 
Do you know God? We're going to talk a little bit about those today who may not know Christ as your Savior. We're going to address that in a minute. If you don't know him as your Savior, you don't know what we're talking about. And we're going to help you understand how you can come to know him. But for us as Christians, are you in the Word? Are you seeking to know him? Do you know him? Do you have a confidence and faith in this God that you belong to, that you've been adopted into his family? Or does he seem a little far off? Does he seem distant? He's only distant because we haven't stepped and, and, and sought to know him. He's given us everything we need in his word to know him. And then as we step out in faith and serve him, he allows us to know him better. Because we can see him all along guiding our past forms. We had time to share the testimony of everything that it took for God to get us here as missionaries. It just blows you away how God directed things. People he put in our past, the things that he did. We look back now and can see, wow, he's pretty smart. But at the time, we didn't know what was going on. I remember the day that, as a young man when I finally realized my dad wasn't as stupid as I thought he was. And I went, wow, he actually knew what he was talking about. Sometimes as Christians, we don't believe that about our heavenly father. We walk around thinking, God doesn't know what he's doing. Oh, yes, he does. Perfectly. Then verses 7 to 12 in Psalm 139, David expands on this idea of God's omnipresence. There, Dr. Stairs, I threw out a theological word. His omnipresence, he's exactly, he's everywhere. And he says this in verse 7, Where can I go from your spirit? Oh, where can I flee from your presence? Again, as I said earlier, nowhere we can go that God isn't. Then he illustrates this for us. He says, if I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, Look at verse 10. Even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. I remember, you know, we used to go to the mall with my dad. When it wasn't busy, you know, I'd be walking around the mall looking at things, you know. But when something made me afraid, I would run over to my dad and grab his hand. I wish I could do that today. But he's with the Lord now. But I used to do that and grab his hand. Why? Because I knew him. I trusted him. I knew that he was going to take care of me. He was going to watch over me. And God wants us to reach out and say, God, I need you today. I want to walk you to walk with me. I want you to take care of me. Verse 11. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be a light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines in the day. The darkness and light are both alike to you. I used to always want to go to sleep with the closet light on. And if it was turned off, I would be afraid to get out of bed and turn it on. I would call my dad and turn the light on. And he, he did make a little fun of me when I did that, you know, because he said I was a little scaredy cat, he called me. But yeah, he came and turned it on too because he loved me. He wanted that light to shine. But you know, we live in a world, don't we, where it seems dark. Here in South Africa, there's some economic uncertainties. In America and South Africa and all over the world, there's all kind of uncertainties with the way the world is headed and the sin that abounds. And we as Christians sometimes, you're tempted not even to go out of your house because of the darkness that it invades <clears throat> everywhere. But God's there. He's in the midst of the darkness. He's the light in the darkness. And he calls us to be, as his children, the light bearers in the darkness, to shine for Christ. And so we ought not to be afraid of the darkness. We ought not to flee what's 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 making difficulties in our lives. Many people want to leave South Africa and go somewhere else, you know, across the fence for greener pastures, you know, like the cow who's got perfectly good grass here, but he sticks his head across the fence to get the grass on the other side. We're like that. And it's because we're not trusting that our Heavenly Father's put us in a place right where he wants us. And oh, remember what we read earlier. He's there with us in the midst of it, and he's holding our hand as we just read. And even when the darkest times are dark, He's there to shine the light on, just like my dad used to turn the light on the closet. So God never has to turn it on. He is it. He's light. So we can't flee his presence. We can't be anywhere that he doesn't know where we're at. The darkness can't have anything to do with us. He's there. Hebrews 13, 6 says, So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? No matter what you're facing today, God's on your side. What can man do to you that, first of all, he hasn't already allowed? And secondly, the worst thing he does to you is kill you. And you 
wake up in glory, seeing Jesus face to face. Many of us, you know, are praying for the rapture. Well, maybe God's going to have us go out another way. But whatever the event is, we're going to be with him. And that should give us hope and joy. So we look at this section. If you're saved today and you're God's child, are you trusting in your Heavenly Father? Do you walk each day with the faith that he's with you? Do you walk confidently in this dark world? Or are you walking in fear? Are you seeking to go somewhere where it's not dark? Trust him. For he has you. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If we have a small knowledge of God, we won't have that. We're not in his word, studying it, meditating on it, living by it, obeying it, walking out and serving him and seeing it happen in action. We're not going to have the faith that we need to live in this world. Talking to someone earlier, sometimes we get so much in the world, we get so busy that God takes us away from Bible study, he takes us away from church, and all of a sudden, the things of the world get so big because we've left God behind. And now, when these things of the world, we're facing it, we forget that the God we have is bigger than those problems. We sing the song in junior church, you know, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. We forget that and we think the world's God is by the tail, as we say. And it's going to defeat us, but it can't. It can't. Nothing can defeat us in Christ. Then as we go to verses 13 to 18, this passage in America right now is used a lot because of the debate again is raging. It's never stopped, but it's, it's raging more about abortion and, and, and the murder than it is. And so this passage is used a lot to support the fact that life begins at conception, and it does. Why? Because God's word says it does. And he says this in verse 13, David talking about now that God is creator. He says, for you form my inward parts. You cover me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my, and that my soul knows very well. <coughs> have you ever had the evil thought like I had? I've had, I wish God would have made me different. Have you ever wished you were different? Sometimes people go to the plastic surgeon and they make themselves different, right? Maybe some of you looking at me today wish I did that. But the point is, is God made us exactly the way he wanted to make us. With exactly the right stuff, if you will. And David recognized that. He said, I praise you. He said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful, marvelous are your words. Now, we shouldn't be too prideful on ourselves. Looking in the mirror saying, oh, God, marvelous are your words. He's not talking about that. He's just talking about the amazing creation that we are. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully brought in the lowest parts of the earth, your, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they all were written. The days fashioned for me. When as yet, there were none of them. The idea that God already has our life mapped out. And God has days fashioned, even though yet they didn't begin yet in the, in the physical sense. God has them all working out. Should give us confidence as well. Then verse 17, David again stops and just focuses back on, on not so much what God has made him, but now God again. He says, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. Did you ever just read the Bible and then close it and you go, Wow, amazing. Now, as I disciple people, I said, Yeah, that doesn't happen every day. We don't every day get an uh, angel singing Bible reading experience, do we? Sometimes we think there's something wrong when we don't get that. And there's times that we've read a passage over and over, and all of a sudden, because of what God's allowed in our life, because of the circumstances we're going through, all of a sudden that passage just jumps off the page. And the, it's always meant the same thing, but now the application applies to us. And we go, wow. God knew this too. That's what David's saying. Listen, your thoughts are Marvelous thoughts are wonders to me. Then he says in verse 18, If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Then we get to a little section of Psalm 139 where now David takes a look at the people who uh, 
aren't really living for God, eh? And they're, they're really God's enemies. They're doing their godless people. He says this. You see, David now, as he knows God and he loves God, now he wants to kind of fight for him, you know, which God doesn't need us to do that, by the way. But David said, listen. He said, all that you would slay the wicked of God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty man. For they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred, and I count them my enemies. Now, this passage of Scripture sometimes is misused by people who want to be separatists. They, they figure, the world's so evil, I'm going to leave it behind. I'm not going to associate with sinners. Well, that implies that they're not sinners anymore, does it? That's the first big mistake. Second big mistake is we need to be out in the world to share the gospel, to share, to share Christ. But we're to be out in the world, but not to be of it. When we look at the sin that's taking place around us, do we get offended for God? Do we kind of say, wow. You, you look at some of the things that laws are being passed in America and, and, and here, and you look at some of the, the pride of people and the, and the gall of people, really, to pass laws that say, listen, if I was born a boy, I can say I won't do that anymore, and I'm going to be a girl. This gender idea. Now, in California, in America, there are kids being born and they don't check their gender. They let the parents choose that later. We just read God already made you the way he made you. Here it says it. It's all one or not. But the point is, they hate what the Bible says. They don't like the fact that there is indeed absolute truth. Just because what they say goes doesn't mean that that's what it's supposed to be. Sometimes Christians get in the trap of trying to be friends to everybody, trying to be politically correct. Um, but we start to feel comfortable in the world that we live in. We start to feel comfortable with some of the things. And that's why some churches are now allowing things to happen in, in God's house that ought not to ever be there. They weren't fit in the world, and they're certainly not fit in God's house. So we have to be careful, and we have to be, again, students of the Word, so that we see sin the way God sees it, and we hate it the way He does. And if we don't, we're going to find ourselves applauding some of these things. I remember, praise the Lord, they took ESPN off of South African TV. Because I remember when Bruce Jenner, who was a hero when I was growing up, he was on the Wheaties box. I hated Wheaties, but I bought the box because it had the sports figures on it. Yeah. But he was like, the, he won the decathlon, which is the athlete of athletes. Eh? Well, now, how long ago, Bruce Jenner decides he wants to be, what's his name, Caitlin? So now he's Caitlyn Jenner. He dresses like a woman, and he was made named Sport or ESPN's Athlete of the Year. And they applauded it. Since in Romans 1, right, not only do they do the things, but they applaud those who do them. So we have to be careful not to fall into the trap of being accepting to everything and everyone just to fit in. It's good to have the hatred that David has here towards sin. We need to share the gospel and pray that they repent and love them, but yet never to start to soften our position to what God's word says. So here we see that David, after he realizes all who God has and does, is grieved over those who ignore this amazing God. Warren Wiersbe says this. He says, if we cannot deceive God, escape God, or ignore God, is it not sensible to obey God? Yes, it is reasonable. But there are those who prefer to oppose and dispute what he says about them in his word. David called these people wicked, violent liars, blasphemers, and rebels, and grieved because of them. And God also grieves over sinners. And you know what? He grieves when we sin, too. I'm not going to go there today, but in Hebrews, uh, it tells us, well, it says in verse 7, no, let's start at verse 5. I won't go there. It says this in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 to 9, talking about us now as Christians who sin. It says, and God's children who sin. He says, have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. For we discouraged when we were rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. I'll stop there a minute. If you're here today as a Christian and you're in some sin that you have not have to be in, if you're born again, you're experiencing chastening. 
It may not be outward things happening yet. But you're experiencing chastening inside. The Holy Spirit is causing a battle inside you. Remember when Paul said in Romans 7, he says, sometimes I do the things I don't want to do. It's because he was born again. He didn't want to sin, but still sometimes he knew he had a sin nature and he fought with it. The Lord chastens those who are his. My pastor used to say, a true believer can't sin and get away with it. Meaning that, well, we may get away with it as far as the world goes, but God sees it and the Holy Spirit is working on a true believer. Then he says in verse 7, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. My dad dealt with me as a son. He chastened me. He did more than chasing me. He chased me as I ran away from him trying to give me a hiding. And I didn't realize that when you ran away, when he caught you, it was going to be a lot worse than before you ran. But you know what? He did it for my good. And every now and then he did discipline me out of anger. But I had a dad, praise God, that he came up to me later and said, you know what? Disciplined you out of anger. I'm sorry for that. What you did was wrong. You deserve punishment. But how I punished you was wrong. And that was a good experience for me to see the humbleness of my father to admit that. So I never feared the punishment of my dad. I feared the pain that it caused, but I never feared the punishment because I knew he meant it for my good. And God does the same for us. He chastens us. Sin has consequences. Oh, we're forgiven. Yes, we're born again. Can't lose it at all. But yet, it has consequences. Sometimes God allows that to chasten us. But he does it so we come running back to him on our knees and say, I'm sorry for you. And that God, the Heavenly Father, is arms wide open. And at that moment, our fellowship's restored. And it is. We've always been there. That fellowship's restored. Are you here? Have you ever experienced the chasing of the Lord? If not, maybe it's because you're not saved. Remember our scripture reading this morning? I'm not going to read all 1 John chapter 3. I'm only going to look at the first couple of verses. <laughs> because again, it's one of my favorite passages in the scripture. <laughs> um, it says this, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. It's kind of like the same amazement that John has that David has. You know, those spots are wonders to me. I, he says, wow. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that we're children of God? Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. If we're too comfortable in the world, it's probably because we're too much like it. Yeah. And if the world's not comfortable around us, praise the Lord, it's because we're too much like Christ. And they don't like it. Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. That day when we go to heaven and our sin is gone. I don't know what's going to be more amazing. Well, obviously, seeing Jesus is the most amazing thing. But then we're going to see him with the first car. No more sin. That's going to be something. There'll be no Red Sox fans in heaven. <laughs> no Kaiser Chiefs fans in heaven, brother. No, but... <laughs> uh, sorry, that was false teaching right there. So... <laughs> but the point is, no sin. That's going to be awesome. We're going to be able to worship our Heavenly Father and be in His presence without guilt. Just, just worshiping Him. The way He really wants us to worship Him now, but we can't. Because we're too often in nature. We're too often we're worshiping ourselves instead of Him. So we're going to be able to worship Him and see Him as He is. Verse 3, and everyone who has this hope purifies himself. Just as He is pure. You know, if we're living with this hope of our Heavenly Father, this hope of seeing Him one day, this hope of seeing Jesus, we're busy trying to sanctify ourselves. We're busy trying to, to be more like Christ. When we focus on that hope, when we focus on who He is, we're busy trying to, to, to live the way He wants us to live. So we don't live to be saved because we're already saved. But we live to thank Him and to, to appreciate Him and to love Him for what He's done for us. So, the question I have is this. Do you have the hope that's mentioned here? Can you say beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're a child of God? Do you know him as your heavenly father? Or you just know the facts? You believe that there's a God. You believe that Jesus died. You believe he rose again. You believe the Bible's true, but yet you've never personally received Christ as your Savior. Remember James says, I think it's James 2.19 says, the devil believes, the demons believe, and tremble. They have a knowledge. You know, the devil was there when Jesus died. The devil was there when he rose again. 
The devil was there before he came down. He knows everything. But he's not saved. Do you know, I remember a brother was shared this morning with this testimony. He knew the facts. But finally, by God's grace in Israel, he said, Am I, am I saved? Am I, am, I, am I God's child? <coughs> Praise to God, he was humble enough to say, I don't want to be sure. He went and told his dad, and his dad helped him, and he came to know Christ. Some people here are proud, and, and they maybe have all the intellectual knowledge, but you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ. You've never been born again, and that's you. Don't leave today without that. The Bible says we're all sinners. That's why we need saved. We're all have sinned. I'm all sure the glory of God. And that punishment in Romans 6, 23 is death. But then Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrates his love for us. And while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. He took that punishment. He took that pain for us. And then Romans 10, 13, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. In our application for Father's Day today, if we look at John 1, 12, it says this, But as many as received him, Jesus, to them he gives the right to become the children of God. If you're not sure you're God's child, just receive him today. Humble yourselves before him. Admit you're a sinner. Tell him you believe that he died for you and rose again, and then call on him and say, God, save you. And at that moment, you'll be his child. How do I know that? Bible says so. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We have a good Father. Don't he gives us everything there is. Blesses us with it. Just as he chose us in him for the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. And having predestined us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of that verse always blows me away. The fact that we're adopted should blow me away. But then it says, to the good pleasure of his will. It pleased God to adopt me. I don't know if my parents, if I wasn't a naturally born child and my parents weren't stuck with me, I don't know if they knew all the stuff I was going to do when I was little. If they would have adopted me, they may have said, Oh, he's going to be that way and do this and do that to his sisters and put the dog in the refrigerator and set the field on fire. And, true confession time. And if he was going to do all those things that he did, is there somebody else? Is there another baby we can adopt? But yet God adopted me knowing everything. And his love never changed. And he saved me in spite of that. Praise God. That's why he loves us. He's a father who Pick this, guys. As my mom used to say, works it all if you pick this. So, and praise God. And that Father will love you and guide you every step of the way. Have you trusted in Christ? Are you adopted? If not, please see myself, Pastor Philip, one of our, our deacons. Now see it, see us, and we'd love to share with you how you can become God's child today, how you can know Christ as your Savior. Now, go back to Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. I've got to pray if I finish the message before Father's Day is over. It says this. Now, again, keep it in context. Everything that David said, you can see, is all of God, his confidence in God, and all those things. And then he says this. See, if we don't have the knowledge that David had of God right then, and then, well, by the way, David wasn't perfect, was he? No. Just ask your wife at time. <laughs> He'll tell you if he wasn't perfect. He's dead because David put him in the front lines. So David wasn't perfect. That's not why David was called a man after God's own heart. David was called a man after God's own heart because he was after God's own heart. He was seeking to know him and seeking to have a relationship with him and seeking to, to talk with him and love him. Because of that, now he can say these last two verses in Psalm 139, knowing that whatever God does in response to this prayer, really, is what this is, whatever he does, David knows it's going to be okay. And here's what he says. Search me, O God, and know my heart. God, go ahead. I trust you. Look inside me and know everything. Are we confident asking God to do that today? None in our own self, are we? We're, we're afraid of what God might find. But when we know who he is, especially now as we're saved in his child, we're going to trust him to look at it. We're going to want him to look at it. We're going to want him to see what we are. 
Why? Because we're going to want our Father's help to help us, to change us. Because here's what he said. He says, oh God, you uh, search me and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. You know, if I could put on the computer screen and, and show up here every thought that you have right now, maybe you're thinking, dinner's not going to go out with that. You good. Or whatever thought we had this week, would we want everybody to watch it as a movie on screen? I wouldn't want mine to there. So search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me. And then look what he says. I can just picture taking the hand of his father and lead me to the way of Christ. Like I used to take the hand of my dad and say, God, Dad, me, help me. Even more so than we do that for Heavenly Father. God, me. But you're never going to pray this prayer with a sincere heart if you're not spending time getting to know God in His Word. If you have a little knowledge in your Christian experience, and some people can be saved for years and not really, they know God by, by their salvation experience. They've been adopted into His family. That relationship that was broken because of sin has been restored, so they have that relationship. But yet, they struggle with going past that day. We were very far past it. And then their limited knowledge of the God of the Bible gives them a limited Christian life. And sometimes that can happen to all of us. It can happen to me next week. If I forget my knowledge of God and quit seeking Him, before you know it, I'm wallowing in fear just like everybody else. But we trust God to take us by our hand. You see, as we get to know God, we love and trust Him more. And as we do that, we'll be able to pray this prayer with a sincere heart. Say, God, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Let's see if there's any way you weigh me and lead me to the everlasting. I pray today that when we leave here, we can seek to know God so we can pray that prayer every day, not as a ritual, but as a request. And say, God, make me more like Christ. That's what he's saying here in this sense. Just make me more like you. <coughs> so, as we conclude, how about us? Stay safe. Not. As I said earlier, stay back. We would love to talk to you. Humble yourself. Maybe you think, well, they think I'm saved already. My brother could have thought that. And you didn't care. You wanted Jesus. So if you're here today, stay behind. If you're saved, do you really know him? Are you daily seeking to know him through prayer, Bible study, and serving him? By the way, through prayer and Bible study, you need to know him. But by serving him, you get to know him even more. Because you're stepping out in faith and walking with him. Is every day Father's Day? Or a lot of the days I can say, well, yesterday was Father's Day, but today is Jim's Day. <laughs> I'm going to live for Jim today. See, every day needs to be Father's Day. Today across the world, the church is weak and does not have the impact it should have in the lost world. This is because the church as a whole has little knowledge of what's heavenly Father. Christians are too busy really getting to know God and live for Pastor always used to say, if you're too busy for God, you're too busy for God. And if we have a small faith, a small knowledge of God, we have a small impact on the world of Christ. So I pray today that you'll decide to truly live with God, seek to know Him more, and from this day forward, make every day Father's Day in each of our lives. That we dedicate our lives to get to know our Father in heaven a little better. I hope today that you think about and meditate all that your Heavenly Father. Think of the Psalm 139 and meditate on it. I hope today you'll be able to say like David said in verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high like an unpaid. Guys, I think sometimes we're not the Christian we ought to be because we quit being in awe of the God who saved us. We talk about him flippantly. But if we walked around in awe of God and, and loving him and serving him the way we ought to be, people are going to see that what we have is real. It's life changing, it's impact. And if God can do that to us, maybe He can do it for them. We need to have that awe of Him in our hearts. We're only going to awe Him. Remember, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. You know, on Friday I was doing a lot of reading the Psalm 139 and studying a little bit. <coughs> Steve was in, in the back 
Well, I'm trying to hide him in the back in case company comes. <laughs> <laughs> but no, Steve was in the back. He was back. He was preparing for what he's going to teach us in Psalms. And I hope he doesn't teach us this week because I'm sure he's going to do a lot better job than I can do. But he was back there studying. And I got done reading this. And I just went over to the piano. Because I was just meditating on this thing and I was just thinking about it. And I started to play just songs that came to my mind as I meditated on this. And Steve comes out. And he said, oh. He said, you know, and we talked a little bit about it. I was just playing the songs that made me think of what I just read. And Steve said to me, you know, you've got to play that on Sunday. Just so we can end your, he said, you can end your sermon by just getting us to meditate on God is. By just playing these, these really just a medley of, of four different songs. What I played. I had to think about what I played after I said it. The first one was In My Life, Lord Be Glorified. After I read Psalm 139, that was the first thing I played. The first thing that came to my mind in music was that message. <clears throat> the second one then is what was played during the offertory, as of the year. And a little water. You know, when you read about what God says, you get to know Him more. You all of a sudden want more. You know, you feel like eating a bag of lazy potato chips. You know, you have a couple and you want more. Right? And the more we know God, the more we want to know Him. Then the third one was before the throne of God above. I started thinking about what it's going to be like to be there. And then the last one I played was how great love. Because how can you meditate on this and realize what God's done for you and not go, God, how great love. So just uh, bear with me. I'm, I'm finished. And I'm just going to play a quick medley of that just to get us in the right mind frame of making every day's podcast better. Meditating on who God is. Then Phil's going to go up and lead us in our last song. Bear with me.